When I teach the Russian Civil War to my pupils, I explain them that it's both the most complicated as well as the most easy conflict to explain. Complicated because of the countless different factions involved. Easy because it can be narrowed down to reds versus whites. And in this video, we're going to take a look at why the reds won the Russian Civil War against the whites. Because there were moments that a red victory seemed very unlikely. Keep watching. Welcome back to the channel. If you're new, I'm Stefan. I'm a Dutch history teacher and I like to hustle history for you. And if you find it interesting, well, consider subscribing and also hit that notification bell. According to historian Robert Garwath, the Russian Civil War can be analyzed as three different conflicts. The conflict of the Reds versus the Whites, the Reds versus the Nationalist factions, and the Reds versus the Peasants. What is commonly known as the Russian Civil War was in fact a whole series of overlapping and mutually reinforcing conflicts a rapidly escalating struggle between the armed forces of Lenin's Bolshevik government and its counter-revolutionary opponents, the attempts by several regions of the western border of the former Russian Empire to break away entirely from Petrograd's rule and peasant insurgencies triggered by the communist forced requisitions of desperately needed foodstuffs. In this video, we're going to focus on the conflict between the Reds versus the Whites. Now, the Russian Civil War is a much broader conflict. I'll deal with the other chapters in the future. And it's kind of a challenge since much of these conflicts overlap. So feel free to add your additional information in the comments below. To give some background, in 1914, Russia was under the rule of Tsar Nicholas II. That year, the country entered the First World War and fought against Germany, Austria-Hungary and the Ottoman Empire. Especially the battles against the much more efficient German armies go very bad for Russia. Due to the war efforts, there was a food crisis at home and a bread riot in February 1917 led to a revolution. The Tsar abdicated. The succeeded provisional government continued the war with Germany and political turmoil remained. In October, the Bolsheviks, after months of continuous agitation, seized power in the capital of Petrograd and in Moscow shortly after. Trying to live up to their promise of peace, land and bread, they entered peace talks with the Central Powers and signed the Brest-Litovsk Treaty, ceding large swaths of land. Signing this treaty showed the pragmatic nature of the Bolsheviks. They were willing to give up land in order to save the revolution because they had to deal with many internal enemies. And these enemies are commonly known as the Whites. Who were the Whites? When the Bolsheviks seized power in Petrograd, there was resistance immediately. And some historians claim that this was the starting point of the Russian Civil War. When the provisional government leader Kerensky, who got away from Petrograd when the Bolsheviks seized power, was on his way to Pskov trying to rally troops, he failed because the Bolsheviks had already gained the support of the soldiers near the front and outside the city. Some skirmishes did take place, it left 200 casualties. By the end of the day, the revolt was snuffed out. Later, military school cadets took over several Bolshevik strongholds. This is known as the Junker Uprising. They waited for the troops of Pyotr Krasnov. However, these troops were still miles away from their position. And thus, this uprising failed as well. Krasnov and his 700-strong Cossack unit was overwhelmed on the 30th of October at Starsu Selo and surrendered. And this was known as the Kerensky Krasnov Uprising. Kerensky made his way out of the country. Krasnov made his way to the Don area. The Bolsheviks, they had control of the geographical center of Russia and the whites they gathered in its peripheries. Northwest of Petrograd, Southern Russia, the Caucasus region, as well as Central Asia and the vast Siberian expanse. Everywhere, leadership was fragmented and the local population divided along class and cultural lines. No single anti-Bolshevik figure or group was able to construct a viable center of authority or an effective fighting force. The empire, like a porcelain vase, had crashed to the ground, leaving a heap of tiny shards, impossible to reassemble or reshape into a new form. Near Rostov on Don, Tsarist officer Mikhail Alexeyev set up the anti-Bolshevik volunteer army that was later headed by Anton Denikin. This army attracted many officers from the former Tsarist army. Eventually, 170,000 ex-Tsarist officers would fight for the whites. 
The main reason why they joined the Whites was that in the wake of the October Revolution, they were hunted down by mobs. So they were basically driven into the arms of the White Movement. The Whites were uniformly hostile to Bolshevik rule, but the label implies a coherence they did not possess. Geographically dispersed and internally fragmented, they had difficulty establishing a firm social base in areas that were ethnically and religiously diverse. The white leaders acted largely independent from one another. Admiral Alexander Kolchak in the east, General Nikolai Yudenich and Colonel Pavel Bermont Avalov in the northwest, General Anton Denikin in the North Caucasus and the Don region, General Pyotr Rangel in the Crimea, warlords or Ottomans like Grigory Semyonov or Roman von Ungern Sternberg in Siberia and southern Russia. Bolshevik Leon Trotsky was the founder of the Red Army. Early 1918, he kept repeating this urge by claiming, Comrades, our Soviet Socialist Republic must have a well-organized army. The question of creating an army is for us now a question of life or death. He managed to get several experienced ex czarist officers on board. As for rank and file soldiers, compulsory military training was introduced in April 1918. And after the Czechoslovak Legion's uprising, I'll get to that in another video, conscription was introduced in many regions. Political commissars were used as the illogical watchdogs and tribunals were created to punish deserters and those who stepped out of line. With his rhetoric and organizational skills, Trotsky managed to create an effective fighting force. This fighting force was not always as effective since its white adversaries were coming from three different directions. During the Russian Civil War, many battles were fought between the Reds and the Whites. Historian Orlando Fajas, he points out there were three decisive battles. In the spring of 1919, the anti-Bolshevik Siberian army of Admiral Alexander Kolchak advanced towards the West with the goal of uniting the White forces. One attack was supposed to reach Arkhangelsk and a second attack towards Ufa. Another force advanced towards the southeastern steppe in order to link up with the white forces there and cut off the Reds from Central Asia. Kolchak was the nominal head of the white forces thanks to his connections with the Allies. He became the leader of the Omsk government. The irony was that he was an admiral that became the leader of a government based in a city that was thousands of kilometers away from the nearest port. Now some argue Kolchak started his spring offensive too early and that he should have waited for Denikin to be ready. But Kolchak had his reasons to attack rather sooner than later. Some success was needed to ensure further Allied aid and recognition for the Kolchak regime. The Reds appeared on the brink of collapse. It started well. Mid-April, Kolchak's forces had advanced 300 kilometers and captured a territory the size of Great Britain. The Volga River was close and the Reds, they were plagued by peasant uprisings in the rear. Near the end of that month, the Red Army, led by Mikhail Frunze, attacked. With many conscripted forces and the help of Bashkir units that had switched sides, they managed to push back the white onslaught and mid-June, Kolchak's forces were back at where they started. After that, the cities of the Urals fell like dominoes for the Reds. The white army crumbled and they hastily retreated. Well, they were routed. Kolchak eventually resettled in Irkutsk near the Lake Baikal and was eventually captured by the Reds and executed. Let's take a look at Denikin's volunteer army in southern Russia. In the first half of 1918, they made a hasty retreat from Rostov and Don towards the Kuban, known as the Ice March, not to be confused with the Great Siberian Ice March, which was used to describe the retreat of Admiral Kolchak's Siberian army. Denikin's forces, they started their offensive from southern Russia in the spring of 1919, around the same time that Kolchak launched his offensive. However, Denikin was forced to make a choice. Either go for Tsaritsyn, later known as Stalingrad, and link up with Kolchak's white forces, or to go for the Donbass, where there were many coal mines and the Bolsheviks were in short supply of coal. Now, eventually he went for the Donbass and the coal mines. And some historians argue that this was a vital mistake. By advancing towards the Donbass, Denikin did ensure the support of the Cossacks due to the Reds' 
the Cossackization campaigns in which during the early months of 1919 some 20,000 Cossacks were executed as counter-revolutionaries, thousands now joined Denikin. On the 13th of June, Kharkiv was taken and Ekaterinoslav on the 22nd. Led by Pyotr Wrangel and with the support of British tanks, Tsaritsyn was also taken on the 19th of June. The rest were plagued by poor morale and many deserted. On the 3rd of July, Denikin issued his Moscow Directive, which was meant to deliver the Reds the definitive blow. The three main white forces were to converge on the capital in a gigantic pincer movement along the main railways, thus cutting off its main lines of supply. It was an all or nothing gamble, counting on the speed of the white cavalry to exploit the temporary weakness of the Reds. It started well. Poltava was taken and soon the entire of Ukraine was cleared of Bolsheviks. Then Denikin's forces moved further north and they captured Orel and were only 400 kilometers from Moscow and 150 kilometers from Tula, a crucial weapon arsenal city. The Bolsheviks were in panic because around that time the northwestern forces of General Yudenich advance from Estonia towards Petrograd. For once the Whites were able to coordinate their attacks and for a few crucial days in October it seemed that this would be enough to defeat the Reds. Yet it did not happen. And why was that? Well, Denikin's forces had severely overstretched themselves. In the rear they were plagued by Ukrainian nationalists Magnus anarchist partisans as well as Chechen rebels from the south. The Cossacks they refused to leave their homeland as the wise did not promise them any autonomy for the Kuban. But the real problem for the whites and the single biggest reason why their offensive ran out of steam was their inability to mobilize enough troops within the newly occupied regions of the Ukraine and Russia. And here the whites were defeated by their own political failures. The whites often resorted to terror, alienating the local population. As Rangel stated, the population has come to hate us. At some point, the Reds toned down on their oppression and they announced amnesty weeks. Weeks which Red Army deserters could return to their ranks without any punishment. Soon their ranks grew to 200,000, twice as much troops as the Whites had. With the help of the striking group of Latvian rifles, some 20,000 crack troops and the Red Cavalry of Semen Budeni, the Whites were pushed back and would never made it back to central Russia again. Pyotr Wrangel would remain with the remnants of the volunteer army on Crimea, which was eventually taken by the Reds near the end of 1921. So let's take a look at the northwest of Russia, where another army was attacking the Reds. This was a northwestern army that was led by General Yudenich. The army was created in Pskov with the help of Germany in 1918. When Germany was defeated and the Reds came closer, they retreated into Estonia that witnessed its own civil war. The army managed to build up and in May 1919 re-entered Russia and advanced toward Petrograd with some 16,000 men. Upon entering former Soviet-controlled territory, they met a hostile population that was not willing to help them. And many conscripts began to desert. Yudenich pleaded for help with the Allies, but he only got minimal supplies. The British, they blockaded Petrograd for a while, but there were no land forces involved. Yudenich then asked the Estonians to help them, but this was a young and fragile nation that was not able nor willing to help the whites, especially when the latter would not even promise Estonian independence. The Bolsheviks, they did promise Estonia independence. On the 10th of October, Yudenich dashed for Petrograd. His troops advanced rapidly as many Red Army troops were fighting in the south against Denikin's army. By the 20th, they had reached the Pulkovo Heights, overlooking Petrograd suburbs. Lenin, he wanted to abandon the city, but Trotsky, he refused. The birthplace of the revolution had to be defended, and he personally took charge in the defense of Petrograd. This was one of the few occasions in the Civil War, much fewer than claimed by his acolytes, when Trotsky's presence at the front helped to decide the outcome of the battle. 
At one point, he even mounted a horse, rounded up the retreating troops and led them back into battle. Trotsky managed to boost morale and wanted to transform Petrograd into a fortress. A curfew was introduced as well as barricades that were erected on the streets and squares. The Whites made a very crucial mistake. They did not cut off the railway link between Petrograd and Moscow. And so the Reds were able to bring in reinforcements. And eventually, 100,000 Red Army troops faced the outnumbered Judenich army on the Polkovo Heights. There was a battle after which the remnants of Judenich army retreated into Estonia where the army was disbanded. Another white army was led by Pavel Bermont Avalov and known as the West Russian Volunteer Army or the Bermontians named after its commander fought in the Baltic Wars of Independence and suffered greatly at the hands of the Lithuanians. The Reds won because they possessed a number of strengths the whites did not possess. First of all, the Red Army was much more disciplined because they enforced inscription in the regions they occupied. Furthermore, some experienced ex Tsarist officers, among which Brusilov, went over to the side of the Reds. Trotsky's effective leadership also attributed to the victory of the Reds. He traveled to the front line and enforced discipline, but also encouraged the troops. He presented the war as an ideological war, which was enforced by political commissars on the front line. Geographically, the Bolsheviks were way better off. With Petrograd and Moscow in hands, they possessed much of the industries as well as the greater part of the railway. And most of the population was living in their area and could be rallied for the Bolshevik cause. The Whites suffered from several weaknesses. Okay, they did get support from the Allies, but much of the supplies they got, got lost due to corruption. Where the Reds had a geographical center and could fight as a united force, the Whites did not and communication was bad. On top of that, they had no central leadership and the Whites, perhaps even more than the Reds, suffered desertions. And lastly, perhaps the biggest and most important reason why the Whites lost the Russian Civil War, they had no unified ideology. The only thing they stood for was the Tsarist Empire, an empire the Russian population come to hate very much. Eventually, the Whites resorted to terror, which resulted into more resistance against the Whites. The Reds also applied terror, and they had to deal with many non-white anti-Bolshevik insurgencies. But their terror was more coordinated. It was perpetrated by their secret police, the Cheka. As soon as the Reds conquered a territory, the Cheka made sure political opposition was eliminated as soon as possible. Lenin was able to centralize power and therefore able to crush the opposition. Thanks to my patrons, you see their names on the screen right now. And a special thanks to Thomas Zabiega, Damien Wallace, Connor, Philip Jordan, Marcus Kaas, Nick Terranova, Haley, Mark Little Hale, Janusz Jorzenkiewicz, Joan, Jester Tabel, Tanya Dixie, Henry Clarkson, Rob Park, Andrea Martic, Susanna Di Bella, John Beach, Fabrizio, Way Back History, Fernando Lopez Ojeda, Luis Pichera, and Mike West. I made an elaborate video about the Red Terror. You can find it right here. And did you know that many ex whites? fought with Nazi Germany against the Soviets in the Second World War. More on that right here. Thank you for watching and das Vedenja.